All right, we got Connor O'Gara here back again from Saturday down south here to talk about Texas A&M, big game against Miami. Connor, I want to get your thoughts. Just it, it, We're going to start with this passing game with what we saw from Connor Wigman, your guy, Bobby Petrino, the Jimbo Fisher offense. Just what would you make of it? 52-10 to 10 win over New Mexico, not a good team, but just overall from the passing game, what would you think? I loved it, and I'm not the guy that likes to overreact to week one. But if it was the same old offensive struggles and it just looks like a repackaged Jimbo Fisher offense that lacks pre-snap motion and it lacks tempo and and we're just feeling like, ah, this is just more of the same, I, I would have been been the guy to, to come out and say it. I, I don't really think that Bobby Petrino has full control of this offense. That wasn't the case. If you watch what AM did, yes, against lesser competition, you should be really encouraged by, by their offensive progress because they finally have the right guy to maximize those receivers. The receiver room is really, really good. But Connor Wigman, even though he spells his first name incorrectly, in my opinion, he made some strides in that game and some in-game adjustments with Bobby Petrino at the controls that just made you go, this guy might be it. There's a reason why he's the most talented quarterback in the 24-7 sports rankings that Jimbo Fisher has had since Jameis Winston. Their ability to make adjustments is going to be a hallmark of this offense. Three of his touchdowns came out of shotgun. He had two that were under center. They have such a fun group if this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be tougher, obviously, against better competition. Miami starting with them. But I, I was really, really encouraged by, by what we saw. It was everything that we had kind of been hoping for in terms of modernizing that offense that was just so unbelievably outdated. It is amazing the success he's had with the way he spells his first name. I'm sure you're pleasantly surprised and, and amazed by his performance. Look, 18 of 23, 236 yards. Those are great numbers in terms of completion percent, not the big yardage total. The five touchdowns are really impressive. Connor, to me, the five touchdowns, what impresses me about it, all five of those were thrown into the end zone for scores. It wasn't one of these things where – you know, you throw it 20 yards and the guy runs for the next third, whatever that might be. All of those are placed in the end zone. And to me, for when I'm watching quarterbacks do that, that that impresses me. You know, I, I, I'm really impressed by that. And again, the, the numbers are varied. It goes, so just the five touchdown passes go 15, 35, 34, 9, and 8. So you're talking about three red zone scores, three outside, and you touched on the receivers with what they have there. I guess the thing is, too, with, with, with Wigman in particular, were, were there things with him that you saw that m maybe some growth? He did get the experience from a year ago. Were there things with, that stood out to you in, in that performance? And essentially, what makes him so successful at this point in his career? Still a young guy. Yeah, still a young guy. Still going to need some reps. Still probably going to make some of those mistakes. Hasn't thrown an interception in his time as a starter, in his five games as a starter, 13 to nothing, a TD die and T ratio. But there's nothing he can't do. And I, I say that with, with some caution because he's still so young and he's going to make mistakes. There will be some limitations. But, man, even when he takes off with his legs, you can't turn around and just play man coverage against him and assume that he's not going to take advantage of that. He had the the quote after the game. I saw Brent Swerneman had this about how he's he's like asked Bobby Petrino, he's like, do I remind you of Lamar? <laughs> Bobby Petrino just like shakes his head. He's not Lamar Jackson with his legs, but he can make you pay and he can get that 15 to 20 to move the sticks. So when I watch him, I see growth. I see a guy who's willing to take a hit, which is big. He made some big time throws with pressure in his face and i like the adjustments if you watch the eight yard touchdown pass that he had to evan stewart they ran the same exact play right before that on second and goal but the adjustment that he made was okay the first throw he put too much air under it it kind of led evan stewart out of bounds the db could could recover and then the next time he flattens the throw out and then it's like boom that six points looks real easy so he's smart enough to be able to make these mechanical adjustments and there's just a lot to like aggie fans are so high on this kid and i i really don't blame him like uh, blame them for for having that optimism the five star thing like all that stuff he looks the part so far but obviously we're going to find out a lot more about him this weekend you know when, when defensive coordinator for miami lance gidry spoke about him he spoke about some of those things as you mentioned the things he's able to do with his feet his arm and, and essentially wrapped it up by saying he looks like a five star you know, and I thought that was interesting. But what was more interesting from a Miami standpoint with these press conference was Mario Cristobal was asked about Texas A&M, the passing offense, because we all saw what happened against the Lobos. And 
And he quickly uh, verted to uh, the run game. You know, hey, they can run the ball too. And I find that to be interesting. I think that Miami's, to me, is going to get beat if they're only preparing for the – if they really think this team's going to run the ball. And I know what they did last year, the Aggies with A-Chain, you know, and maybe their history, they're, they're maybe used to running the ball a little bit. I just – I think this is the biggest point for Miami. Essentially, can Miami – slow Wigman down. I think that's going to be the turning point of the game. If they're able to defend them in the passing game, I think that's where this game is going to be won or lost for the Hurricanes. If they're going to be able to defend, whether get pressure on Wigman, then certainly they're going to do that. But if they're going to be able to defend these receivers downfield, and, and I, I just think from watching it, I, it just feels like a Petrino offense with what Connor can do, these receivers, I feel like that's where Miami's got to make sure they're paying attention to it. If they're expecting this running attack to just erupt or explode, I just don't think that's going to happen. So that will be interesting because, again, Cristobal quickly, again, it was just like a quick response and want to make sure everyone knew that they could run the ball. And, and look, we're we're not uh, – that that wasn't the question. It was just an interesting response. He did it again, too, later in the press conference. Um, the, the the weapons uh, that, that, that Connor has, you know, with Evan Stewart, and I know you think he, you know, when we talked earlier, you thought maybe this guy that could lead the SEC in receiving and watching him last year, watching him this year, he looks like he's a threat for 150 every single time out with what he's able to do, short, deep, uh, you know, his playmaking ability. What would you make of Evan and then seeing Noah break out like this, uh, six foot six target? Yeah, class of 2022. But uh, this is that this is A and M's offensive vision come to light. These three classmates starring in that way, and then oh by the way, you've got Anaya Smith, your offensive captain, who's going to make a lot of plays. But I, I think what's interesting and in what you saw in the openers with these guys, they're moving them around a lot more. Evan Stewart last year pretty much was exclusively on the outside, which I think he's sub six feet. If you're a sub six feet receiver in the SEC playing on the outside, getting separations are really difficult thing to do, especially when you don't have a quarterback situation to speak of. And this year, it's obviously much different and they're moving him around. He's getting some of those looks in the slot and, and you're going to see a little bit more variance in that way. And, and I, I I find myself really encouraged by their weapons. Like Moose Muhammad is considered like he was like their fourth weapon in, in the opener. And that's kind of a crazy thing because he was a guy at one point where you're like, is this guy going to be the best receiver on AM? So there's just no shortage of weapons. But, you know, kind of getting back to what you're talking about with, with the ground game as well. This identity of this offensive line, they are really optimistic that it can be what it was in 2020. 2020 was AM's best fin- tied for AM's best finish in the AP poll since 1939. Like this is a, a group that that really hopes to get after you up front because they have continuity there and they hope that that can be a big fixture of their offense and it's going to keep Connor Wigman protected. So you you need to be able to give him time to be able to maximize these weapons because they're, they're going to make plays, they're going to come back to the ball and they're going to do it from all over the field and that's probably the biggest difference with what we're seeing early on. Again, just one week against New Mexico, but a very encouraging start. I I thought just seeing the variance in the way that those receivers were used kind of interchangeably.